Hey, everybody. Welcome to the first ever uh, shop talk. I'm excited to be in my shop doing this. Um, hope everybody can hear me. Put your hand up or uh, type in if you can't hear or see me for some reason. But uh, we'll go through a little bit of the housekeeping on what you can do if something breaks down on your end. But uh, I wanted to show my little shirt here. So, yeah, so the idea came to me, you know, um, being a hands-on guy, I like to see how things work. I like to put it in my hand. I like to see it work. So I had this idea, you know, maybe I could do a presentation for my shop. So we've been practicing for a week now. And the best way to uh, to do that, how we could do a live demo on a course, as you, most of you probably know, you know, trying to stream something these days sometimes works and sometimes it doesn't. So here's my plan is I've got a bunch of slides I want to go through first and then we're going to go to this demo behind me but I did pre-record that so I've got it as a it's just a minute and a half video at the end where I can go up and show you some things on that so um, it might sometimes be a little jerky on your end depending on your uh, you know your connection speed and stuff like that but you know let us know how this goes because we'd like to keep doing some live demos and if we have to change technology or whatever we'll, we'll do that so we want to get it to you so yeah thanks everybody for showing up tonight we've got a great group here and let me uh, just go through a few housekeeping slides so yeah, sometimes if it breaks down, you know, if it starts to get jerky or pixelated or the voice goes wah, 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 sometimes just log out and log back in and you might get a better connection. You know, this the connection to the Internet goes through all these different switches all over the country. So sometimes just logging out and back in, you get a better connection and uh, it'll it'll work out better for you. And that's a tech support number for uh uh, go to webinar we lean on them quite a bit when we have technical problems and so far they've been helping us out uh, mary does most of the heavy lifting on the back end of these so she's on board here tonight it's going to watch questions and stuff but um, thanks to my team for showing up so yeah we thought we'd schedule four of these and see how it goes and those are the next topics we have coming up we'll do it at the same bad time same bad station uh, every week and uh, we'll just keep going until uh, you guys had enough of it but I got uh, plenty of things to talk about and share with you so this is one of my favorite topics I like talking about errors so and the other thing that uh, Mary at the end of this is going to tally up and let us know what we raised today for the um, for a couple of different charities that we selected here the world central kitchen which uh, goes around these are actually chef made meals that they send out to hospitals and they go all over the world when there's a, a crisis somewhere and help out and then uh, uh, the same with the samaritan's purse they're, they're actually helping in italy quite a bit also so that one kind of crosses uh you know crosses the ocean and helps out a little bit so those are the first two we thought would be good to uh yeah we're going to put up to five bucks for each person that uh, attends tonight so um and we'll pick a different charity every time and keep that going if we can. So, and you know, our uh, the owner of our company, Marco Cleffi, started this, and he donated a big donation to some of the local hospitals over there. In fact, we got a picture here yesterday of uh, looks like a brand new MRI machine or something that one of the hospitals bought with uh, the donation that he made to him. So, uh, he likes doing that. We like doing it, and I think it makes everybody feel good in these kind of weird times that we're going through right now. So. All right, let's get right into air. So this is what I've got. You know, I think we can do this in an hour or less. Like I say, there'll be a minute and a half video at the end. Maybe a couple of them. I filmed a couple of them. If they look good and work good for you folks, I'll show a couple of different ones. But um, I'll cover most of this with slides. Um, these will be, at the end, there'll be like a post-webinar survey. And if you want these slides, you're welcome to have them. You just click on that and we'll we'll just mail you a PDF of uh, the presentation. This will be archived on a new, as a YouTube that uh, Mechanical Hub will have access to that. And uh, if you want to watch it again or somebody else would like to see it, you can just pass that link along. So the different topics, yeah, we're going to talk about air, we'll talk about oxygen, we'll talk about pressure, what to avoid, you know. <clears throat> The good news about air, it's a pretty easy thing to eliminate once you know the technology, once you understand the mechanism of how air gets in there, where it comes from, and where to put the components in the right order. Uh, so it is a, a easy, uh, easy to fix problem if you have it in the system, and we'll show you some of the tips and tricks for that. So. I think it's important first to talk a little bit about air and understand, uh, well, there it is, the little bubble right there shows what air is. I mean, it's mostly nitrogen is what's in the air, 21% oxygen, some inert gases, some dust or pollution, different things in there. But uh, what happens is when we fill up a hydronic system, there's going to be some air in there. We're going to do the best job we can, purging the big bubbles. You know, we're going to put isolation valves and purge valves, and we're going to get most of the air out. And then we'll get our circulators going, and we're going to start moving that fluid around, and it's going to have entrained air. It's going to have dissolved gases in there. We want to get all that out. And in a perfect world, what will happen is we'll get the oxygen out. And the way the oxygen leaves a closed loop system is it oxidizes any ferrous metals in your system. So if you've got a cast iron 
a circulator pump, if you've got some you know, steel nipples that you connected the boiler with or whatever, those are gonna oxidize. And once that happens, you should have what's called dead water. And dead water is like what well, you've heard of the dead zones in the Great Lakes in the, in the summertime when there's a big algae bloom, it consumes all the oxygen along the shoreline of the lakes or wherever those algae blooms are. And then there's not enough oxygen in that water anymore to even support the fish life. So that's what they call dead zones. Well, the same thing happens in a hydronic system. You could get to the point where you have dead water. And if you have that, you won't have any more corrosion. If there's no oxygen in there, you're not gonna have any more rust. That being said, it's really hard to keep oxygen out of a system. It can get into so many different places. I'm talking oxygen at the molecular level. <clears throat> and so, uh, you know, we deal with that on an ongoing basis by either putting chemicals in there. A lot of the hydronic chemicals will have a component. All oh, different brands use different components, probably a sodium sulfide, something like that, that absorbs any oxygen that gets in. But of course, you've got a chemical romance now, and you've got to keep adding those chemicals every so many years to boost up that oxygen scavenger to keep it out of there. So, so Mother Nature hates an imbalance of any type. If you've got high uh, temperature in a building, and you've got cold temperature on the outside, turn the heat off, and what's going to happen? Obviously, the building's going to get as cold as it, you know, the heat's going to leave and the building's going to get cold. The same thing with humidity. Got a lot of humidity inside, humidity starved inside the building, high humidity outside, that humidity is going to come in the building. The same thing happens with oxygen. If you've got an oxygen starved condition inside a system, inside a pipe, inside a tube, Mother Nature is going to try and balance that out. And the way it happens in PEX tubing is it goes through the wall of the tubing. And that's, it was hard for me to grasp that. Well, wait a second, I put 150 pound air pressure on this PEX tubing and it stays there for a week doesn't leave and you're telling me oxygen's getting in there yeah it is and then we're talking oxygen at the molecular level and you'll see here in the next picture um, how that works on the tubing and how they uh, how they show you what's uh, acceptable as far as oxygen so it's an insulator you know if we have it in our pipes if we have it in our boiler heat exchangers we don't have good heat transfer so we want to get it out of there we want to get it out of our radiators we want to get it out everywhere so let's look a little bit more about the uh, Oxygen and Corrosion. This was an, a really interesting book I read a couple years ago. If you'd like to read, uh, certainly get this one. And it was written by uh, an author at Brights for Outside Magazine. And he looked at corrosion in the U.S. and all the problems that it can cause. And he looked at the Alaska pipeline. He looked at a lot of different things. But uh, one of the things he did was really interesting. He went to Can University in Golden, Colorado, a ball company that makes canning jars. They also make, I don't know, 1.3 million aluminum cans a year. When they make an aluminum can, you go to them and let's say you've got uh, Eric Ani's uh, energy drink and you go to them and say, okay, I've got an energy drink. I want you to can or bottle this for me. And they'll analyze that drink and then they'll build an aluminum can and they put a barrier inside that aluminum can that number one protects your product from getting the taste from the aluminum and also protects your product from eating away the aluminum can. So it was pretty interesting how they, uh, they formulate all these different internal coatings for cans. And the same thing if you buy a gallon jug of milk at the grocery store, it's going to have an oxygen scavenger in it. And they're going to put a barrier in there. Otherwise, the product will spoil because the oxygen is going to go through, believe it or not, the wall of that plastic jug. So inside that PE, whatever plastic that jug might be made out of, there's going to be a barrier in there for oxygen, protects the product, keeps it from spoiling, and it keeps the taste of the plastic from getting to the milk also. So down here, this DIN standard is what we use in the industry. And this was developed and it's been upgraded a few different times, but it basically says the acceptable amount of oxygen that can, now it's in metric units, that can go through the wall of a PEX tubing. And they do that at 40 C, and that's the amount there. Now, I don't know if that means much to you, one gram per cubic meters, but what's important about this to know with the PEX tubing is the higher the temperature, the more that oxygen can ingress in there. So if you run that PEX up around, even with an oxygen barrier, EVOH barrier, whatever it might be, if you run that up around 160 degrees, that oxygen ingress goes up quite a bit. It's 2.5 times higher. And we know that by if we do a high temperature system like uh, maybe a fin tube, with PEX tubing, we tend to get more oxygen ingress in those. You'll see expansion tanks fail a little bit sooner. So you can't stop that oxygen 100% with just putting an EVOH barrier on. You can limit it. You can lower it down to a point where it shouldn't cause a lot of problems, but know that it does get through there. The only way to prevent it is use copper tubing. You know, oxygen doesn't get through the wall of a copper tubing. And so here's some of the issues. Obviously, if we have an air pocket somewhere in our system, uh, we can stop flow completely. So if we go over a beam or something like that, this is where we can trap air. And of course, we stop circulation completely if we have a big enough air pocket like that. 
This example is an old picture that Heat Boy sent me years ago, and I know where this came from. This was on a non-barrier tubing system, and that pump, I mean, you can barely even get fluid through that anymore, and that was caused by the oxygen ingress on an ongoing basis. So every day, every month, every year, oxygen's going through the wall of that. It's eating away the, the body in there. It's eating away any steel component, the expansion tanks, are turning into that sludge you see there. So that's air, this is oxygen, and of course noise. You know, you can hear air going through turns and pipes and through radiator valves and different things, and obviously that's gonna insulate some of the heat away. So need to get it all out there. We gotta get the big bubbles out, we gotta get the small bubbles, we gotta get the micro bubbles, we gotta get the entrained air. These are all different types of air that's uh, within your system. So one of the ways that we get air out of, of a solution and we get air out of a system when we purge it is pressure. And so the first thing you need to do when you walk into a mechanical room from this day forward is I want you to find a gauge somewhere on the system. And if there isn't one that you believe or trust, take a gauge with you, screw it on the boiler drain, have a good test gauge on your truck. One that, you know, maybe a stainless steel case with maybe a glycerin filled so it doesn't bounce itself to death in your truck. And keep that as your good trusted gauge that you can test systems with. And so the, what I want you to do is turn everything off, turn all the pumps off, turn everything off and read that gauge. And that indicates the static fill pressure. That's the pressure somebody, maybe you, put in that system the very first day you filled it. And so what should that pressure be? Should it be 10, should it be 12, should it be 15, should it be 50 pounds of pressure? What does the pressure have to do with it? Well, this little chart over on the side kind of indicates that pretty well, is the amount of pressure that you put on the bottom of a column of water has to do with how high you can lift that water. So if I've got a, a 10 foot column of water, if I wanna get water up to the top of this, I've gotta put about 4.33 PSI on the bottom of that, to, lay, uh, to lift that up 10 feet. Now, if I had a building that was 12 feet tall and I only put four pounds of pressure on that, I'm gonna have a big air gap across the whole top piping of that building because I haven't put enough pressure in there to squeeze that air bubble out. It's not the circulator pump that's gonna take this little gap at the top of this out. Now, the number is 0.433 PSI, just under a half a pound of pressure to lift water up a foot. Now, if you round that off to 0.5, you can do the math in your head. So if I've got a 30 foot tall building, I'm gonna need 15 pounds of pressure to fill that building up. You know, It'll give you a little extra with the fudge on that you know, conversion to 0.5. But in addition to filling this up, so if I put enough pressure on that to fill that all the way up to the top of where this air vent is, I'd like to have a positive five pounds of pressure at the highest point in my system. That could be the manifold upstairs in your bedroom closet or whatever the highest point. Could be an air handler in the ceiling somewhere. And the reason I want to do that is with these little float type of air vents here, the way these work is uh, the little float in there, when the fluid comes in, like in the picture, it floats up. Well, it's the buoyancy of the float that's shutting that little valve in there off. If we put build this all the way up and put a little pressure. Now I've got a little pressure that's helping me make the seal at the top of this vent in addition to just the buoyancy of the float. So positive five pounds of pressure at the highest point in the system, just do the math and you can, uh, you can come up with that. Most of the time when you get a fill valve or an expansion tank out of the box, it's gonna say pre-charged, typically 12 PSI is what they pre-charge. Don't believe that, sometimes that leaks out, sometimes they overcharge it. Always check your expansion tank before you put it into the system, but that's the number and it would vary. If you're working on commercial buildings that are 40, 50 feet tall, you're certainly gonna need more than 12 PSI to fill that system up to get the air pushed out of that system and <clears throat> help you purge the system. Not gonna be a sales presentation. I will show you some of the vents that we make just for the, the uh, you know, just to know what's out there. So these are a lot of the different vents that you'll see out there. These are typically auto vents, we call them. A little float in there just floats up. Air's in there, float sinks, water comes up. Different sizes, different connections. You can get different accessories. There's some manual air vents that we make, some little hydroscopics, repair kits. Now, when you go and you buy a vent like this, there's a couple numbers that you'll see on all the air vents. There's gonna be the amount of air that it can remove. That's usually in a CFM uh, rating on it. So that's the amount of air that can actually come out of that vent when it's working. There's gonna be um, an operating pressure. And most vents are gonna be 150 pounds. So that means you could put up to 150 pounds static pressure on this vent. There's also a working pressure. And our vents, like some of these are 75 PSI, we make some 90, I think we make a 120. We make a couple different uh, working pressure ratings on these vents. And what that means is, let's say this one, and I think it is, a 75 PSI working pressure. 
if I had a high head circulator or something in that system that can develop 75 pounds of pressure, this vent isn't going to let out air out after 75 pounds of pressure. The vent's just going to be jammed all the way up against its seat and you're not going to get any air out. So if you have a system that can develop that kind of delta P in it, either from the pump or the height of the building, you want to make sure that you've got an air vent that's got the higher pressure rating. So again, if I had a job that was developing 75 pounds of pressure, either because it's a tall building or I got that much delta P, I probably want to look and make sure I've got at least a 90 PSI working pressure air vent on it. <clears throat> Most of the work that we do in residential, the 75 PSI are plenty of um, working range on that. But if you do get into commercial work, if you do get in those situations, just know if you got an air vent, you put it on there, no air ever comes out of it you probably got the wrong air vent and it's just jammed up against the shutoff and it's not going to let air out until you drop the pressure way down. And we'll talk about some of these other accessory uh, items that we make that can be added on vents to really kind of enhance the performance of them. Watch my time here. Yeah, I mean, shout out if you have a question as we go here. I'd, I'd just as soon answer them when we're on the slide if you want. Okay, so, yeah, you um, is there anything out Bob, there? I've got it. Um, yes, I've got a question uh, right. from Daniel Leary, and he is wondering uh, about the dead water. Does that turn the white PEX piping gray? Um, yeah, I guess I'm not quite sure what he means. I mean, dead water just means it's it's water that's been starved of all its oxygen is out of the water. So. Does it turn the pipe? Gray. Oh, does it turn? I see what you're saying. What turns the pipe gray is when you do have oxygen in the system and whatever it's oxidized. Like if I put a brand new circulator pump in a job and I came back two days later and took the Allen bolts out and put it out, it's going to be gray in there. Or maybe if it's had enough oxygen, it's going to be red, rusty color. It's that gray coming off that cast iron metal that gets into that tube. And, you know, probably a year after you put the manifold in with all those little sight gauges to adjust the flow, you can't read them anymore because the water's turned gray. It's pretty hard to stop that. You know, if you put a chemical in there from day one, maybe had a blue tin in it, like the what I've got in the system behind me, you might keep that water clear, but you know, it's gonna pick up any uh, solder flux, any pipe dope, anything that's in that system. It's really hard to keep a system perfectly clear of water in it. But yeah, that gray color is an indication of there's been some corrosion has gone in, inside there. Now, one way you can stop that from happening is Pipe your system with all non-ferrous metals, you know, stainless steel, copper tube, stainless steel pumps, stainless steel expansion tank, just like we would if we come across a non-barrier tubing system, we'd probably turn everything in that system into a non-ferrous metal so we don't have rust, we don't have corrosion, we don't have, a, you know, expansion tanks and all those components failing on us. So, yeah, thanks for that question. That's a good question. And Bob, I've got another question uh, wow. from, from Bill. Problem. Excuse me, Bill, if I'm pronouncing your name incorrectly, but Bill D'Agostino. Uh, if you had an air vent that was set to 75 PSI, yep. but your system routinely went above 75 PSI, would it not only um, not work, but it would, would it lead to a shorter lifespan? Uh, I, that's a good question. I mean, it definitely wouldn't work, but you know, if you look at the mechanism, maybe I can point to it here as we look at that. Basically, what'll happen is this just this little needle in here, which I've got an example, one of those right here, is just going to be jammed up against the seat. And so probably the best place for that air vent to be to have a long life is never work at all. Take it out of the box, it's always in the closed position. So as long as that needle valve isn't opening and closing a lot, it's probably going to last a long time. But yeah, unless you're going way over the working uh pressure range, I don't think it would damage anything up on the top end of that. You'd have to have a lot of squeeze to, to ruin this little, I'll just show you what's in there, at least on a cleppy, and I think all the air vents are similar, but it's not unlike what you see in a Schrader valve. It's just this little stem that goes against a little O-ring in there and makes the seal. I'll show you a, a cutaway of that coming up. So um, yeah, the key is get the right vent for the application. Now there's a couple things that I learned, which I didn't know my whole career as a plumber, almost 40 years now I've been doing this, is this little picture here, so what happens on this cutaway is when this vent is filling up with, um, well, air first, air is coming out, air is coming out, and the water gets up to this point right here. That's the point where that float's going to float up and it's going to shut that needle valve. And notice there's about a half inch of, uh, I call it a head space or an air gap in here. And so all my career, I would go and take my little Tecmar screwdriver, whatever I had, and I would push this little valve down and I would just hold it down until water spit out of there. That told me, well, whatever this vent's on, a tank, a manifold, a boiler, whatever it is, I know I've got water filled up into my vessel, up in my boiler. Well, you don't want to do that because this little headspace in here, 
that's designed to be in there to protect this little needle. Because if I held this down and let's say I've got uh, I have Teflon tape, I've got sawdust, I've got whatever debris in my system, and I hold that valve down, immediately I suck all that debris right in this little needle valve right here. And you might have an air vent from the day you put it in, it drips, drips, or sprays, or squirts, or whatever. And that's because you should have left that little air gap in there to make sure that I didn't have the crud going right up in my valve that might be floating up in that water. Now, if you do want to burp an air vent, I would just loosen it on the thread right there until water comes out, you know, just lo loosen a thread or two, you see water coming out, tighten it back down, you know your system's filled up to that point and you don't have to push that needle valve in and, and lose your little uh, air gap that's inside there. Bob, I think you triggered a nerve because we have more questions. Right, um, now, <laughs> I am going to open the uh, mic up for Todd okay. Landon. He's got his hand up. Okay, um, Todd, perhaps you'd like to ask the question directly to the boss himself. So like boiler water treatment yep. and the air vents. So yep. you notice that the new condensing boiler manufacturers are really wanting us to put boiler water treatment in. Yep. And I've been using it for a few years. Mm -hmm. And I just want to make sure that, you know, is there a recommendation for boiler water treatment? Well, I mean, there's a lot of different brands out there. I mean, I have a favorite brand just because it's made in my local town here that I've liked and I've worked with those people a little. I think any of the name brands, the key, here's two keys about putting boiler chemicals. And the very first thing you should do, even on a brand new piping system, is put a cleaner in there. I would just fill it with whatever's water is available on the job site and put a squirt can of that cleaner. And everybody makes it now in those aerosol cans, Fernox, Romar, Sentinel. And the cleaner is going to take out your pipe dope. It's going to take out your solder flux, which is zinc chloride. You certainly don't want zinc chloride in your stainless steel boilers so get all that stuff out and then fill it up with good water and then put your conditioner chemical in with good water now you might have good water on the job site just check the pH check the TDS check the hardness of the water if it's within the spec that the boiler manufacturer tells you put it in there and then put your chemical in and that system should be good for years and years and years now, most of the chemical people will tell you, go back in two years and just take our little test kit. Some of them have strips. There's different ways you can test it and test it. If the pH is plunged way down, you've got a problem. Something's going on in that system. Um, if the hardness or something's gone up, it might mean you've got a leak and it's been taking on water, taking on water, taking on water that you didn't realize. You've got a pinhole leak in it somewhere. But that going back every couple years and testing, it's going to be an indicator whether you've got it sealed and it's in good shape. But the, here's the thing about the chemicals that we put in there. There's about four key ingredients in those hydronic conditioners. There's going to be an oxygen scavenger, so that residual oxygen that you didn't get out when you heated it up and purged it out and, uh, you know, oxidized your metals. It's going to have a probably a sodium sulfite in there. Again, different chemicals are used for that. It's going to have a pH buffer, so it's going to buffer your pH up to a neutral range so we don't have aggressive water, we don't have too alkaline water where we start coating things out. It's going to have a film provider in the... Oh, I've got a cutaway, a pipe here somewhere. A film provider, it's almost like if you got inside a brand new piece of copper pipe and somebody took a magic marker and just put a thin coating on it. The film provider that they put in the chemicals just puts a very thin, a couple micron thick coating and it protects your metals. If you rust, so to speak, or put a, a coating on the inside of your copper, inside your stainless, inside your aluminum boiler, whatever it might be, it's going to protect that metal. So if you do have aggressive water, if you do have aggressive glycol goes in there, it doesn't attack the metal. So you got an oxygen scavenger, you got a pH buffer, you got a film provider. There's a little bit of lubrication in there for your pumps. Uh, I work with Romar here in town, and they tell me there's 27 different components that they have to put into their hydronic conditioner so it can work with copper, worked with stainless, worked with aluminum, worked with all the multi-metals that we have in your system, which is why they cost so much. There's a lot of stuff that goes in those, but I'm a big fan of good water and uh, water treatment in the system. I think it just gives you the best you know, longevity for all the components in your system like to have good water quality and that's clean the system, good water, then put your, your chemicals in on top of that. Bob, I'm yeah. going to ask you another question. Okay. Um, uh, did I lose it? I'm sorry if I did. Um, do air vents, this is from Andrew Roberts, do air okay. vents have a hysteresis band, i.e. if a vent is at approximately 520 kPa, kPa scales, I don't know, <laughs> what does it reset at? 
Um, I think you're talking about on the, uh, the, the valve mechanism in here, what the range on the, I guess, hysteresis or differential on that. I mean, obviously, when the float goes down, this is wide open. And then, again, the uh, operating or the working pressure is how much it can shut off against. But there's not really a range in there. I don't know if Kevin, our product manager, is online. If he can think of something that I'm not answering correctly on that, uh, Kevin, jump in or something like that if you, if you understand that a little bit better. No, not really. I think, Bob, when there's enough air, that float will sink just enough to pop open that little needle valve. I don't think there's any kind of a built-in hysteresis. The needle valve will seat against that soft seal, so there's probably a little bit of um, a band in there. Know, maybe so, um, some sort of a dead band, but it's really negligible, and it's not something that uh, uh, is measurable, I'm sure. Yeah, and it, you know, I'll ask the engineers in Italy, if they've heard of that or know that, it sounds like you're working on metric units if you have that number there. So maybe I can find out a little bit more and we'll pass along if I do learn something, because I like to learn stuff too. So um, so yeah, in the picture again, just cutaways of what how these work in there. We have different versions of that. We've got a vertical version and stuff like that. But let me uh, get into a little bit more of the meeting, unless you got another question there. I mean, shout them out anytime. Well, Bob, we actually have a million, but I'm going to ask you one more. Uh, right. from Jared Gluck and then at the end perhaps we'll have a little bit more time but in the interest of, of time so okay. the question is you said to keep the system without non-ferrous metals if you don't want to have discoloration in the water yeah. so is it stainless is stainless steel a ferrous metal well, it depends on the grade of the stainless, and actually the 300 series of stainless, 304, 316, uh, can actually get a little corrosion on them. I just read that. I was uh, actually researching the stainless steel that's used on the outside of buildings where they put uh, some of the facade or they make those balusters and parking lots sometimes out of stainless steel. The 300 grade, they tells me, can get a little bit of corrosion and get a little bit of rust spots on it. And I actually, in one of my trucks years ago, I had some stainless steel on the toolboxes, and I would get these little pit marks. Um, it depends. There's a lot of different grades of stainless. Uh, the 400 series actually sticks to a magnet and when I do the demo on this I'm going to put some 409 stainless chips in there because they'll stick to my magnet but they won't rust my piping and stuff so it does depend on the grade of it but again if you've got the conditioner in there it's going to coat that out and that metal won't get those little rust spots or pockets on it you know different manufacturers have been trying different stainlesses over the years you know indirects used to be 316 and they went to 304 some of them now use 316 for the shell 304 for the coils some of them are using 409 for the coils every grade of aluminum has different properties some of it might weld better some of it might take expansion and contraction better for the coils where they get hot and cold so uh, i don't know that anybody has the perfect stainless you know some of them use a ti titanium stainless beastman tends to use a ti which is a much more expensive grade of stainless where they put titanium in it. There's an AL series out there, which is Algany Ludinum is a company back in Pennsylvania that has a, a special a stainless grade that they make that's supposed to be a little bit more resistant. So um, yeah, it depends on the grade of stainless, but it certainly can get the, those little rust spots on it if it's a, a lower grade, doesn't have as much nickel or chromium in it. Anything else, Mary, you want to keep rolling? Well, why don't we keep rolling? And if folks, if you can be patient, we'll try to get to those questions um, a little bit later in the presentation. But in the interest of time, we'll we'll try to keep moving here. Yeah, and some of them we might answer as we go along too. So what I want to show you here is just you know most vents are made this way now, but the thing of it is when a vent leaks, if it's dripping, if it's spitting, if it's spraying, something's stuck in there. So just take the cap off, and most of the time, right there it is. You're going to see that Teflon tape shard in there. You're going to see a little you know if you reamed your copper tube and some of those shavings got in there. Most of the time you can get the cap off of this and get in there and service it and put it back into a, a working condition. Now those can get ripped in there sometimes. That little O-ring if uh, something sharp in there can damage it or I suppose after 20 years it can dry out a little bit if they've never had water up there but uh, if you've got a new vent that's leaking a little bit uh, don't be afraid to take this cap off and get in there and try and uh service that we do sell just the cap as a replacement part and another thing that's good to put on an air vent are these little service check valves and basically that when you screw this into that it pushes open this little seal here and so now if you have to take this apart someday to clean it or service it or replace it you've got a little shutoff mechanism i really like these the only issue i have with these is we sell them to people and I don't think uh, the next uh, troubleshooter comes and knows what that is. He looks at it and he thinks it's just a maybe a thread adapter, doesn't realize it's a, a, a valve in there to make it easy for him to take it apart. And they tend to sometimes take it apart at the wrong connection at this thread here, not realizing maybe we should put a label or sticker on it and say it's a service check not a thread adapter but it's a handy thing to pay, uh, to put on your air all air vents are going to leak i mean i'll be honest with you. it's not a matter of it 
it's a matter of when. So just make it simple to be able to uh, for the next guy to be able to repair it or service it. Bob, we have. Um, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but we have an, uh, a hand up. So let's uh, invite Gerard the Bross. I'm going to unmute you. Whoop. Gerard, if you unmute yourself, you can ask. You can ask Bob. Yeah, let's talk. There you go, Gerard. Uh, these, hey, how these air vents uh, work with the uh, glycol? Yep. All of our, I mean, I speak for my brand, we accept up to a 50% of glycol, and that could be ethylene or propylene. You know, we don't like to see ethylene used, but sometimes we know in bigger commercial buildings, uh, EG is still a viable fluid. It's actually a better heat transfer fluid, but no, they're rated up to uh, uh, 50% on pretty much all of our products, really, air vents or uh, zone valves, whatever it might be. I would think other brands are rated for that, too. Okay. The the problem with glycol is when it goes bad is when it gets ugly. I mean, if the glycol goes bad, it turns to acid. Glycolic acid is what you have, and the pH drops. Then it can get more aggressive towards metals and seals and stuff like that. Usually, if you've got a glycol job that all of a sudden starts seeping out of joints here and there, check the pH on that, and there's a good chance that glycol has been stressed, and it's time to either uh, flush it out and replace it or boost the uh, – you can put inhibitors in. If it doesn't get real bad, you can boost that pH back up in the, you know, the 9 or 10 range, but uh, at some point, the glycol needs to be – you know, we had – if, if you guys are interested, we had a really good speaker on – I don't remember, Mary, when that was – a one of the guys from Dow Chemical did a glycol seminar for our coffee and coffee, and I learned a lot in the hour about glycol, about uh, you know what causes it to go bad, how you fix it, and different things. So if you want to go to our <clears throat> YouTube station, look up that uh, I think it was just called glycol, and it was uh, Kevin Connor from uh, Dow Chemical that did the presentation for us. Uh, so here's a job that uh, had a little, just a manual type of air vent on it, on this uh, bleeder L on this uh, fin tube here. And obviously, it's been leaking. So this is the little vent we make. This is a hydroscopic vent, and it's a, a manual vent. If you turn it in one direction, you can just bleed out your um, your circuit there. And then when you turn it the other way, it's an automatic vent, and it uses these little fiber discs in there. So when the discs are dry, the air can come through and it'll vent out. As soon as fluid hits that, within two seconds, these will swell up and shut off. So it doesn't have a needle and a valve stem or anything in it. This is the shutoff mechanism. So some people like it because it doesn't have a valve that can get plugged up. Now, this is a little ball check that allows you to take this out and replace it someday. When you pull it apart on this thread right here, this shuts closed and you can replace the cap. Uh, we say about every three to five years, you might have to replace that. But sometimes uh, this is a nicer vent on a dirty system, and you can see that's what um, what Jason did here. I hope he, this isn't his skid mark from laying down his uh, torch or something on that carpet there. But, um, yeah, thanks for sending us a picture. We like to see how our product's being applied, and that was an example of an Instagram picture that we, we asked him if we could share on the uh, presentation. So. A couple problem solvers. So what can happen on an air vent, and I'll show you where this happens in a couple slides. If you pull a negative pressure condition on an air vent, air can come into an air vent. So if you've got a customer that's got a chronic air problem, they call you up and they said, listen, I've had 20 plumbers over here over the last 10 years. They bleed the air out of my system, and two weeks later, I got noise, I got air, I can't sleep at night. How come nobody can solve this problem? There's a good chance somewhere in that building, somewhere in that piping system, he's got an air vent that's allowing air to go in the system. And then it happens if you put an air vent under a sub-atmospheric condition, under a vacuum, under negative pressure. I'll show you where that happens in a system. So we thought about that. We said, you know what? What if we made a cap? This cap right here is a check valve. It lets air come out, but it won't let air go back in. So you could take the regular cap, whatever might be on your air vent, and screw this on. Now air can still come out if you've got an air bubble in there, but it won't allow air to get sucked back into there. So you can fix a problem that's been in a building for years and years that nobody understood what was happening. Now, know that you're treating the symptom, not the problem. You should go back to that job in the summer when you can drop it down, and I'll show you why that's happening in a couple slides. This will just fix it in a short time until you can go back and correct it, but know that we've got that little check valve. They're not very expensive. It's nice to have in your glove box for that um, that chronic air problem that nobody else has been able to fix. The cap in the middle here. Yep. Oh. Go ahead, Mary. Okay, well, Take a breath for one thing, and okay. then I've got a question here from Steve Wyland. Okay. And he is wondering if uh, can yes, a micro bubble absorber cause an air vent yeah. to pull air in? Yeah, we're getting to that. That's a great question, and that ties in with what I'm saying. I've got a kind of a, a visual of that coming up in you know, two or three slides here. That's 
Yeah, that's an important thing to know. And that's kind of the gist of this whole topic is how come I've got a chronic error problem on a system when I put in all the high dollar components, I've done everything right. Why do I have a reoccurring error problem? And again, corrosion because of an oxygen ingress. So give me a, a couple slides, Steve, and we'll get to that. Hope everything's well with you. And uh, we have one hand up as well from Jeff oh. Haskey. Jeff, I am going to uh, unmute you. Okay. Uh, you are self-muted, Jeff, so if you want to ask that question, uh, it I'm looks here. like he isn't. Are you there, Jeff? Okay, we're going to move on. Yeah, you, you you have a little microphone next to your name, and you got to click on that, and that'll unmute you. We can't do that from this end. you got to unmute yourself. We can open you up, but you've got to unmute yourself. So if you want to try again, we'll try it. If not, uh, type it in, and we'll make sure to answer your question. Um, so where was I? So in the middle here, this is a hydroscopic cap that can go on any of our air vents. And all we did is we put a stack of those fiber washers in here. And this is really nice. If you're going to put an air vent in a critical location, like maybe in a, a ceiling, a drop ceiling on an air handler, a manifold up in somebody's closet or a hardwood floor, this is a second protection mechanism for this vent. So if someday something gets stuck under that little needle valve I just showed you, this cap is going to catch whatever comes through there and it's going to shut it off. So it's a nice thing. We sell some of our wholesalers buy all their air vents with this extra hydroscopic cap. And these are the little service check valves. We've got those in eighth inch, quarter inch, half inch that you can put on any of our vents. So think about this. I could take just a basic old vent. I could put a service check on it. I could put an anti-vacuum cap. And I could actually put the hydroscopic cap on the top of my check valve. And now I've got four functions in this simple little auto air vent. I've got a check valve. I've got the check valve here. I've got my service check. I've got this check. I've got the air vent that works by itself in here. And I've got the hydroscopic. I've kind of got a four-in-one device, which I think is the next picture. So that's what it looks like with all the components. We're going to give one of these away. We're going to have a trivia question towards the end here. But there's a service check, uh, the anti-siphon check valve cap and the hydroscopic cap. And by the way, this will fit on a lot of other brands. Most of the air vents now that you see out there, Watts, Take or whatever, are made in Italy. They are made with that same metric thread on there. The only one I found that this doesn't work on is the old, uh, the Maid of the Mist, which has just a regular tire Schrader valve type of stem on it. It's not a metric thread, but pretty much all the brass air vents out there are um, you know, made in Europe, made in Italy, made somewhere there, so they're going to be a metric thread. With that in mind, here's an adapter that we sell. You can find these on McMaster Car. I think Taco offers them too. It turns that metric thread, which is what, about a six millimeter, into an NPT, and now you can put a tube, you can put a hose on it, you can put an adapter on And why you might want to do that, this is probably uh, one of my favorite slides here from up in Canada. A lot of the boilers, if they don't have an air vent built right into the heat exchanger on the boiler, they're going to send one with the boiler, and we supply a lot of those to OEMs, and they're going to say, put a T on the top of the boiler and put that air vent up there. So as we fill, fill, fill these IBC boilers, that air vent's going to make sure the air comes out of that heat exchanger, and we've got a, you know, the heat exchanger full of water instead of air bubbles in there. Well, if you look at what this installer did, he put adapters on there and he put a copper tube off of every one of those air vents on the top of these boilers and he's taking it down to the floor just knowing that someday if that vent discharges, guess where it's going to go? Probably on your microprocessor, probably on your inducer fan in there and now you've got a $1,000 repair instead of just an air vent. He's done that on all three of these boilers and here's our big uh, hydro separator and the same thing, he's got a copper tube on that. I don't know, maybe they go to a drain, I can't quite see where they all end up, but at least it's not gonna run down the side of the equipment when it, uh, when it does just charge someday. And this actually is boiler sitting right be, behind me here, this little lock and bar night, and uh, it had a little quarter inch. I put a nicer vent in it. I put the uh, service check valve there. I got the hydroscopic cap on it just so I don't make a mess inside here someday if that vent does leak. So here's what's going to happen is every time a burner starts up, you're going to get a flame temperature, you know, random numbers here, let's call it 1800 degree flame temperature. The wall temperature, that metal, the stainless steel on the outside of the, the coils of this little uh, geonomy type of heat exchanger, again, it varies a little bit. They're going to see a wall temperature somewhere in those 300 degree range. So every time that burner comes on and that metal gets hot, these little micro bubbles are going to form. And an indication of that is take a saucepan out of your cupboard tonight, put water in it, put it on a burner, turn the burner on, and within seconds, you're gonna see little bubbles are gonna start forming on the bottom of that pan and they're gonna rise up to the top. And they're gonna do that every time this boiler starts up, unless you have a device that gets these out of the system. Because here's what happens with air in a system. 
when I raise the temperature of water, I'm going to drive these micro bubbles out of solution. If that temperature in that boiler goes back down to room temperature, you know, when there's a no heat call, these little bubbles are going to be reabsorbed into that water. They're going to go back in the solution. Every time you heat up and cool down, heat up and cool down, these bubbles are going in and out, in and out, in and out. So you need something that as these bubbles start moving through your heat exchanger and we get them back to your air purger, I need a device that gets, and some of these, when I call it a micro bubble, you don't even see. You, they're so small, it looks like cloudy water, which we'll show you when we get the demo going here. It looks like you got a blender going on in there. Those are tiny little micro bubbles and you need to get them out of there. And there's only a couple devices that can do a good job of uh, doing that. Just know if you have high temperature applications, we do make some solar rated. These are rated for operating temperatures of 360 degree, 320 degree, 320. So if any of you guys are doing solar work, uh, you should use a solar rated because a regular 215 degree air vent's not gonna last very long up on the roof on a solar array that can get well over 300 degrees. Um, all right, if you leave this uh, seminar with uh, one piece of information, I want you to understand the concept of pumping away and why it's so critical to everything we've talked about so far for air elimination, for happy pump operation. So I would highly recommend you get Dan Holohan's book and read about it. I'm gonna give you just a thumbnail sketch of what pumping away means. Wherever you, the guy that puts the system together, connects the expansion tank into this loop of piping, let's just call this a loop around a building, whatever it might be, wherever you physically make that connection of the expansion tank into the system, you develop at that point exactly right there, the point of no pressure change, P-O-N-P-C. That's the only point in this system that this circulator pump can't change that pressure. If this is a 12 pound or what do we got here, a 10 pound uh, precharge on this tank and I fill this system 10 pounds of pressure, this circulator can't change that pressure right there. Now notice I've got a little bit of droop. If I've got a foot of piping here, even a foot of pipe has some pressure drop when flow's going through it. So I'm showing if I had a gauge right at the suction of my circulator, I'm gonna read about nine pounds because I drooped a little bit here from that point of no pressure change. Now, if I could put the expansion tank exactly there, it's gonna be 10 pounds of pressure. So I went around, I piped this, I put a gauge at every corner of this uh, circuit as I went around here and I filled it up to 10 pounds static fill pressure. So every one of these gauges is gonna read 10 pounds of pressure. Now I'm gonna wire this up and I'm gonna plug this in and let's call it a 007 since it's green. And as soon as I plug that circulator in, it's gonna increase the pressure on the discharge side of that circulator. How much? Well, it depends on the type of circulator. It depends on what this piping circuit is, how many feet of pipe, how many fittings are in there. But let's call it eight pounds of pressure differential. And that's fairly typical on these little wet rotor circulators and six, eight, 10 pounds of pressure differential. So notice every gauge in the system is jumped up in pressure because I just added that differential pressure that the circulator by the centrifugal force is added to that system. Now, as I start going around my circuit through my pipe, through my elbows, I drop pressure. You know, I'm down to 17 pounds here. I'm down to 13 pounds. I'm down to 11 pounds as I come around the last bend. Still at 10 pounds of pressure here, even though the circulator is running. So the circulator adds all its pressure as a positive. So let's change one thing in this drawing right here, and let's move that point of no pressure change to the other side of the circulator. And you're going to see this on jobs when you walk into them. From this day forward, look at where that expansion tank is not physically located. I don't care if it's in the next room. I don't care if it's in the next building. This connection into the system needs to be on the inlet side of the circulator. Now you're going to come across jobs where you might have 20 circulators and say, okay, you know, I got all these circulators. Where do I put? There is always a best spot. And we'll get into that in another session on where to determine the best spot. So over on this drawing here, I move that circulator to the discharge and now I plug that circulator and says, well, wait a second, I can't change that pressure right there. I can't add water into there. Where would I get it from? I can't subtract water out of there. You know, where would it come from? Since I can't change the pressure right there, I'm gonna make my differential from the suction side of my circulator. So in this case, I put five pounds of pressure in there and my suction, uh, I'm gonna maybe take a six pound uh, pressure differential and it takes it from the suction side. And here's what happens. So, I'm getting away with it here. I still got a little positive pressure, I got a little bit here, but about halfway around this circuit, I'm down to zero PSI on that gauge. If you had a gauge on this building and you're pumping at that expansion tank, it gets worse. As I come around here, look what I've got going on here. 
I've got a sub-atmospheric, I've got a vacuum in my system in this circuit right here from probably about this point, halfway around that circuit all the way down. So guess what? If this was an auto type of flow type of air vent, what do you think is going to happen every time the circulator kicks on and I pull a negative pressure on that air vent? It's going to suck that float down. It's going to get a gulp of air in there until the fluid comes back around and raises it up. Every time it starts, gulp of air, gulp of air. So over the course of weeks or months or years, whatever it might take, I've got an air problem again. And I can't understand why that's going on. And all you have to do is just move that expansion tank connection to the suction side here. And immediately you're going to get this... Um, this is what's going to go on. You're going to raise all the uh, pressure in your system. Now, if I've got a boiler with a high pressure drop, I'm going to want to put that boiler on this side. So this positive pressure shows up in my boiler. If you've got a low um, pressure drop boiler, like a cast iron boiler, not as critical. But most of the new high pressure drop boilers, once you're pumping into them, so this pressure increase gets shown up in the heat exchanger, keeps it from flashing the steam in there. Make sure that the pressure switch on that boiler is always being made because I've got that extra positive pressure from my pump differential going in it. So one of the best things you could do with a problematic air job is look at that expansion tank relationship and correct it. And the other way that you fix that, like I just talked about, is putting that... Uh, anti-siphon cap that we make on that air vent. So if this was an air vent that was seeing that condition and I had that check valve cap on it, I won't get that air in it. Now I haven't fixed the problem, which is this relationship right here, but I've solved that uh, that ongoing air problem. Uh, so for, yeah, we're doing pretty good here on time. Um, all right, there's another thing that happens in a hydronic system, and it's called cavitation. Some of you guys have heard this term. Usually you'll hear it in regards to a pump, when a pump cavitates. And what is cavitation? What does it mean? Well, I like to think of cavitation comes from the root word cavity. And what is a cavity? Well, a cavity could be a hole in your tooth. Well, cavitation is a hole in water. It's actually a vapor pocket, and it can form in a system, in a pipe, actually. I'll show you how it can form in a pipe. If I've got a low pressure, if I drop the pressure at the eye of this impeller, Below the vapor pressure, whatever the fluid's in there, if it's water, if it's glycol, it's going to have a vapor pressure, which changes with temperature. And if I drop below that pressure, I form these little uh, bubbles in here. And they're not really an air bubble. They're actually a vapor pocket. And what happens to those, when they get out through the impeller, they collapse. And when that va vapor pocket, this cavitation bubble, let's call it, collapses, <clears throat> it develops a really strong, actually a supersonic speed uh, force right between the bubbles and it's almost like you've got a sandblaster going on inside your system. Usually you can tell this by the sound the pump is making. You'll hear it it's like it's got rice krispies or it's got gravel in there. You think there's rocks going through the circulator when in fact what you're hearing is all these cavitation bubbles imploding. They're actually imploding kind of like when you take an old vacuum tube and break it with a hammer and the glass gets sucked in. It's an implosion and it's a very aggressive force and here's a couple impellers that have actually been damaged by cavitation. And this can happen in a few months time with a big pump if you've got this going on from the day you put it in there. The way you fix that is you gotta get more positive pressure on this pump to get out of this condition where I'm getting down to a sub-atmospheric condition, dropping down below my vapor pressure or whatever fluid, the water that's in there, the cavitation goes away. Usually it's just a matter of increasing your fill pressure a little bit. Um, it's also, where you're gonna see this is on those outdoor wood furnaces that are open systems, there's very little pressure on the circulator, they're running 190, sometimes 212 degrees when people boil them over. Those circulators are really prone to cavitating because they're in the worst spot possible. They're at the highest temperature, they're at the lowest pressure on the system, and this can happen to those circulators from the day you put it in until a year later when that circulator dies, and that's what's happening, is you're forming these little vapor pockets and it's gonna destroy that impeller in there. Hey, Bob, we have a good question. This is Kevin. Right. Um, a question uh, is, then you were just talking about the location of the expansion tank. And the question is, why is the reason some schematics show air elimination device on the connection point of the expansion tank, which normally is the colder side or the return side of the system? Yeah, so we're going to get to that. And, you know, the expansion tank doesn't need to be on the air purger. Just because we put a convenience port on the purger, the expansion tank needs to be at the hottest point in the system. It needs to be right at the discharge of the boiler. Now, that may or may not be the best place for the expansion tank. If you've got your circulator pump 
either in the boiler itself or you're pumping into the boiler, I want to move that expansion tank down wherever my circulator is. I mean, a lot of the combi boilers have circulators built right into them. I need to have my expansion tank down by that circulator on the return to that boiler. Uh, I don't want to screw my expansion tank in the air vent. The expansion tank really doesn't have anything to do with the air vent other than it's a convenient place to put it. Some cases it might be okay to have it there, but you don't necessarily want your expansion tank in the port on your air purger. It might not be the best place to um, uh, have that located, and it certainly doesn't need to be under the air purger for any air elimination uh, feature. It's just there because, again, that's a convenient port. I think that I'll, I'll clear that up when I get to another slide a little bit more, too. <clears throat> um, all right, where was I? Now, cavitation, let me talk a little bit more about that because cavitation can actually happen in a pumping uh, piping circuit. It doesn't have to be related to just the circulator pump. And where it can happen, if you put a tight, small restriction in a pipe, what happens, I don't know if you can see these pressure gauges very well, is when water goes through a tight restriction, you get a really high velocity increase. So let's look at that in the schematic over here first. So there's my pressure. And when I squeeze it down through a tight opening, what I'm gonna get is I'm gonna get a velocity increase just like you take your garden hose and you put your finger over the end of the garden hose and you get it to squirt a lot further because you've restricted that flow and you're increasing the velocity and you squirt a long way. So in this uh, diagram right here, by squeezing down that hose or pipe or whatever it might be, my velocity goes up but look at what happens to my vapor pressure. I get down this area right here and that's where I can get that cavitation forming. So it forms here and that's where it collapses when it comes through this restriction, which is what I'm showing right up here, a pipe that's been kinked off and I get that restriction and that's where you're gonna hear that crackling noise. In fact, if you go out in the yard this summer and pick up your garden hose when it's running full speed and take it and just start kinking, kinking, kinking and you're gonna to get to a point where there's just a very little opening and you're gonna hear that Rice crispy sound. You're gonna cavitate right in your hose. So it doesn't have to be in a pump. And where this can happen is somebody's put a globe valve or a ball valve in here and they shut it off to isolate a component to work on it and they go to turn it back on and the handle breaks off or the stem breaks off on that globe valve and it just opened a little bit and you don't realize that valve just has a tiny little window. And from that day forward, you've got the potential to form these little cavitation. And it's gonna sound like you've got an air problem in the system when in fact you're cavitating because you got a restriction in a balancing valve that somebody's choked way down or somebody's kinked a piece of PEX tubing when they put it in the wall and now you've got that little restriction in there. That noise that you hear is the cavitation form in there. And it can get worse. This is the Glen Canyon Dam and the, the Utah Arizona border. This is a 40 foot diameter concrete pipe, 10 feet thick wall, reinforced concrete, and it cavitated to a point that it actually wore half of this tubing out and it started chewing into the bank on the side of that dam. And they almost lost the Glen Canyon Dam in 1983 when all this high water was coming down through this pipe. At, uh, I ran the calculations on this. If anybody wanted to take a guess how many gallons per minute goes through a 40 foot diameter pipe uh, when it has full velocity like that. I think it comes up to 53 million gallons a minute was going through that pipe. And there were some rough surfaces in that pipe that were causing that cavitation. And it actually eroded in a couple of days time when they were spilling these spillways at full speed when that high uh, water year happened. And then they had to get back in there and rebuild these piping sections with, um, with concrete and built that 40 foot diameter tube back up. So it can be a pretty destructive force. As you can see, it's something uh, Catch 22 about these internal checks. You know, I like the idea that the pump people stepped up and said, listen, you guys need check valves on your circulators. Let us help you out. I don't like a check valve in a circulator like that. Number one, it's too close to a turbulent condition and they can chatter sometimes. But if you put them vertically like this, what can happen over the summer, if you've got little air bubbles that were trapped in there, they can come up to this check and not make their way through. And you go to start this pump up in the fall for the heating season. And now you've got an airlock pump because all these air bubbles got trapped into the blue. So, you know, in a perfect world, I'd like to see a check valve about uh, eight pipe diameters away from the discharge. But, uh, you know, maybe it's a lesser of two evils. It's fixing a lot of problems we had with ghost flow. But uh, if you do have a problem with a circulator airlock and a lot, it could be that little check valve is uh, keeping the air in there. Now, ideally, I'd like to get that air out of there and that would go away. But uh, some of the older systems with these type of air vents, you never get all the air out of a system with this type of scoop. It just can't happen. It's physically impossible for this type of device to catch and stop these little micro bubbles and get them to go up to this condition right here. Really all this is is a wide spot in the road. And when fluid comes in and it sees, let's say it's coming in here at four feet per second and it sees a wide spot in the road, it slows down just for a second or two as it goes through this device. 
and that's the mechanism that's making the air bubbles go up to this little vent in the top of it. Now, some of them put veins in there, some of them put a little ramp in there trying to get the air bubbles to get coaxed up to that, but there's really nothing in here that causes these little bubbles to stop, to you know, come together and go to the top. That being said, if we would have taken this device years ago and put a piece of a screen door screen or something in here, these little bubbles would have grabbed onto that and we would have what we have today, which is a micro bubble resorber. Um, all right, so here's a little solubility. You can find these online. Basically what we're showing here is the temperature of a fluid here and the pressure of the fluid here and the solubility of water or air in water. And the very best place to always, always, always get air out of solution is gonna be at the hottest point in the system. So let's say we're running at these temperatures up here. So the hottest point in your boiler is gonna be right at the boiler. So that's where I'm saying, always put the air vent here. Now here I could add the expansion tank on the return side of this. This pump is seeing the point of no pressure change through this big wide open boiler, even though it's you know a couple feet away from it. This still is establishing the point of no pressure change through the pipe, through the boiler, through the piping up to this circulator. So I am going to see that pressure increase. Now the next best place to get air out of the system is going to be the lowest pressure point in the system. And the lowest point of pressure in the system is always going to be the highest point. So if I've got a manifold or an air handler or a cast iron radiator up on the top floor of my building, I want to have a little air vent up there. Maybe it's just a manual air vent, but a flow type of vent. It's going to keep working for you. So as this air comes out of solution at that low pressure point and at the high pressure, this is going to do 99% of my air removal. This is going to catch air that rises up when the system goes off or any air bubbles that um, are formed when you change the water, something like that. But they really do work in conjunction with one another. I think that might have helped with the question that Wheels had. And so here's what it is. So <clears throat> what we know is if we take water from 50 to 195 degrees, and let's say I've got 100 gallons of water in the system, that just raising that temperature across that range there from 50 to 195, what, 140 degrees there, two gallons of air is going to come out of solution. So you better have a device, you better have an air vent that's got the ability to get that air out of there. Otherwise, it's going to keep going around in your system at ever uh, causing problems. Uh, the other thing that can cause this to happen, this air to come out of solution at that kind of amount, is the pressure. If I could take the pressure of that fluid up, you can see the same thing happens there. I'm going to get about 11 gallons of air out of that system by just dropping that pressure from 75 psi, dropping it down to atmospheric, which is what, 14.7. So it's both the pressure and the temperature. What I would do on every boiler that I put in is I would take it when I'm standing in front of it and take it up to 190 degrees. Even if you do that only for an hour or 15 minutes, you're going to drive most of the air out of solution that comes out against the wall of that boiler by raising that temperature up. Now, it might do that when it goes in a domestic water call, but at that high temperature is really going to help you get that air out quickly. You won't get it out at the you know low temperature operation like you can at high temperature. So this is really, you know, I'm going to credit Spirotherm with the first one of these. They said just put something in that chamber and these little bubbles are going to get stuck as they go through there. Different companies use different products. We use a composite media that goes in there and it grabs all those little micro bubbles. It does use the velocity decrease by this big chamber in here but it's really these uh, fingers, these little fine points in there that cause the air to come out of solution and go up to the top of that. I'm getting the, uh, the hook here from my wife about my time. Sorry, I'm kind of running over. We'd love to help you with whatever air solutions you need. We go all the way up to 14 inch pipe size from three quarters. So if you need something, give us a call. We'd love to help you spec it. Um, all of our air vents are rebuildable. You can take the cap off them. You can get in there, you can clean the needle out. You can replace this cap if you have one that's damaged. So it's a very user-friendly uh, air vent to repair when it's on the job. Fill valves, maybe we'll cover this in another session. A lot of the air elimination comes with your initial fill. You gotta have a lot of flow going through your pipes to push the air along with it. If you've got 10,000 feet of radiant tube and you're trying to purge it all at one time, you're gonna spend a lot of time trying to get that air out. Break it down into small sections or get a fast fill valve that can put in five, six gallons a minute. You know, bypass your valve if you have to, but the pressure is your friend when it comes to getting air out of the system the very first time you get it going, so. In some cases, you know, you might want to get a purge cart with a little bit of a, you know, horsepower here. We've got a half horsepower pump on this, so we can get you about, you know, 12, 13 gallons a minute out of there. So you can do a, on a bigger piping system, you can get your flush a lot quicker than depending on your fill valve to do that work for you. Get this book and download it now. Uh, Amtro's got this on their website. Um, 
It used to be a hard copy, and now they've got it as a PDF. I learned a lot about air removal, especially these old systems. I know some of you guys see these systems out there still. This is an air management system. There's a difference between an air removal, and I didn't know this until recently. I'm, uh, you know, I'll admit it. I didn't know exactly what was going on with these old compression tank systems. And what I mean by air management, I've got to keep air in this tank. If I lose this air bubble by putting an air purger on here and I suck that air out of there over time, I'm going to pop the relief valve on my boiler because now I've got a waterlogged tank. So if you do have a system like that, You've got to have a device that the air that you're taking out of this boiler, out of this piping, can be diverted and goes back up in the top of that tank, and that's my expansion space. There's no bladder, there's no diaphragm, there's no physical separation between the air and the water in here. So you got to maintain that air bubble, which is why we call it an air management. Now, what I could do, I could put a cleffy disc out right here, and what I would do is take that little tube I just showed you earlier, and I put the tube up into here because that's really what they're doing with this B&G fitting, is they're just taking the air that's coming out of solution here through this little Venturi type of fitting and putting the air um, back into my expansion tank here. I've got my water, my air separated in here. <clears throat> uh, some guys love these tanks. You can still buy this tank. They do a good job. There is a lot of heat loss from a tank like that because it's just bare metal. I'll tell you, if you do replace this with a diaphragm tank, it's going to be about one third the size of that because just the the process of putting a diaphragm between that air bubble and that water uh, that's in that tank, you can reduce the size of it because you're not dependent on the, uh, uh, you know, the just the water touching the air in this system. So the difference between air management, air removal, is the type of the expansion tank that you have on it, basically. So get that book, read up on it. There's a lot of really good information about sizing uh, expansion tanks and sizing it. So that's what I was saying is just put an air purger in there, but take the discharge tube and uh, run it up to the tank so that air that you suck out of here is still in there for your expansion space in your compression tank. And there you can see a circulator on the return side uh, pumping at the compression tank. You know what, with these little uh, Bell & Gossett Series 100, a very low head pump, they only develop about three or four pounds of pressure differential. You could pump in an expansion tank with this type of circulator. What goes wrong with this right here is somebody goes back and they take that old Series 100 out of there and they put a pick a pump, you know, a 15, 58, whatever you put in. And now I've got a medium head pump and now I've got seven, eight pounds of pressure differential. Now I start having air problems because I'm pumping at my expansion tank with a, a little bit more pressure than I had with that old, uh, that old flat curve Series 100. All right, I got a couple more slides and we're going to get to my uh, my demo here. Know that we do make, I think we're the only company out now that has a low lead air vent. So if you do have to put an air vent on a domestic water uh, system, you know, it needs to be low lead right now. We can help you with that. All right, so this is a demo. I'm going to do a little video here and I want to just go over this. So I made this as a little trainer thing. I used to haul this around with me when I had a sprinter van. So Basically, I just took a bunch of uh, clear acrylic tubing and I made a clear acrylic um, disc L dirt. This is both an air separator and a dirt separator. I made a couple Grunfoss pumps out of clear plastic uh, there that I just put the motors in and I got some other components here. I've got a quick setter here. I've got a, a dirt mag that we'll talk about in another session here. I made a, a clear plastic four in one, SEP4, so that's air, dirt, magnetic removal. Uh, and then I got some piping. So I put a little blue uh, glycon just so you could see it a little bit better. So the demo I want to do today is I'm going to take and I'm going to inject air into the system and I'm going to show you how this little micro bubble resorber grabs those little air bubbles as they come around there and how quickly it does that. You're going to be amazed how uh, much difference that you can make by just upgrading your air separation device. Now, let me see if I've got a couple other slides here, Mary, before I go. All right, so what I did is on this display behind me, I used 7 8 acrylic tubing. It has a 5 8 uh, inside diameter, that should be, because it's a pretty thick walled pipe. So I just went, uh, the Plastic Pipe Institute, by the way, you guys should go over there and snoop around a little bit. They've got a bunch of really good information on any plastic pipe. It could be PEX, PEX L PEX, PERT, but they got a lot of nice calculators over there that you can do a bunch of calculations on it. And this is an example one where you put in all the information and it'll tell you what the, uh, the flow rates um, you put in there and it'll tell you what the um, the flow velocity is going through that pipe. So with the pipe I have, if I take the GPM reading from the quick setter when we get this going, I can convert that into how fast the water is going through that tube. Hydronics, we want to be somewhere between two and four feet per second velocity. That's a sweet spot. You get over that and you'll see what happens when we get over here. I'm going to run this up to about 
six feet per second. Think of six feet, stretch out your arms if you're six feet tall, your wingspan's about six feet. Think of water going across that distance every second. That's moving pretty quickly. Hard to get air out of a fluid when it's moving through a pipe or through a separator that quickly. So, all right, let's see what I have to do here, Mary. That's what it's gonna look so, like. Um, so I'm gonna- do your last slide with the- Let me get to my- um, no, I'm going to do my demo first, and then maybe we'll come back and do. Uh, we will come back and do questions, and also do a little bit of uh, housekeeping to end it up. But let me did this. Now, bear in mind that if you don't have a really fast connection, you might. Uh, this might be a little jerky. We practiced this at four o'clock today with four different people, and three out of the four people it worked perfect. And the other guy said it was kind of jerky, jerky, jerky. It's not me. It's not us. It happens to be the um, the speed of your connection. All right. So let's um, this version right here. See if I can do this right. We have a rookie at this here. See if this is going to come up. Yeah. No, there I am. My mechanical hub shirt. All right. Let's get this going here. This is only a minute and a half, so bear with me here, and we'll we'll come back. Hey, we'll here. This. Now we're going to do a live uh, air separation demo on this board that I built over here, and I want to show you a little bit of how it works and how I built this. So this is built with a clear acrylic tubing. You can get that from uh, usplastics.com online. They can ship that to you. It is a copper tube size, so you can use grip fittings to put it together if you want. You can glue it also. So inside this here is a cluffy disc scale dirt, and it's built with this composite media, and that's what does the removal, both the air and dirt removal. We'll get this going here in a second. I'll show you how that works. A couple uh, circulator pumps here. I build them in a clear plastic block, so you can see the impeller in there. You can see the air on the impeller. You can see cavitation and just see how the circular actually works in real life then over here i've got let me turn this on i've got a, a quick setter cluffy quick setter so we can see the flow rate that's going through that we can translate the flow rate in the fluid velocity uh feet per second so we know when we get in that sweet spot that two to four feet per second velocity coming around here just my little fill i do have a little bit of glycone there the blue just so it shows up a little bit better a little tougher to get the air out but it does uh, i think jump up the board a little bit better now if we can move down a little bit Closely spaced tees here. We're not going to talk about this today. That'll be for another session, but that's a like closely spaced tees. Then I go down, flow is going to come across this and go back up. And then we'll see the air removal here. So up at the top here, if you can look at this, this is a little, uh, it's just an aquarium air pump that I bought from PetSmart. And I can inject air into here. I can regulate how much I put in there. And then you'll see how it goes around through the loop I just pointed out. And you'll see it come back here and you'll see the bubbles come out and you'll see how air separation works. So if you're ready, let me turn some things on here, get my pump on. I'm going to put a, uh, a shot of air in there. And now, if you watch when I pull this out, get my flow rate going. Let me get a little bit more air in there. Now, you'll see those air bubbles going around. And then if you put the camera over here, you can see the air coming out. And you see very little. Some of the small bubbles are going to go through. This is going to take about, oh, maybe five minutes for that air to go around and after five minutes you'll see this will be completely free of air here you'll see all the bubbles will stop coming out now if this was clear water it happens in about five minutes in fact almost too quickly to really see it work but by putting the glycol in here the viscosity of course a little bit thicker so uh it gives up its air a little bit slower so maybe that does work out better for um for watching it and um, i don't know if you can see it on the camera but see how this water is uh, swirling through here that's an indication of turbulent flow conditions it's almost going through like a corkscrew if you can see that you can see it when the air bubbles come through how it winds through there and that's what you want when you're trying to get heat out of a pipe or heat out of an emitter or something like that you want turbulent flow conditions i can slow the circulator down until i drop down below the two feet per second and you can see i can actually get down to where you can barely see the water moving through here laminar flow which of course would <clears throat> excuse me good for heat transfer so uh, let me just do another quick one here turn the pump off another shot of air turn it back on and you can see the air going around there and immediately the big bubbles come out and then the little ones collate on this uh median side there the coalescing median there and again after about 10 minutes here you'll see this fluid will be completely uh, blue colored, free from air, dissolved air, oh trained God. air, big air, all the air that we need to get out of our system will come out with the separator after time. This is also going to do dirt in another session. We'll put some dirt and some deposit stuff in here and we'll watch how the bottom part works. So that's what I've got. Thanks for watching. Let me just do one more here where I really cranked up the flow rate in that. <clears throat> Double click on that. Yeah, try it. I haven't seen 
Now, different here is I really cranked up the pump speed and I'm going through there about six feet per second. You can see right there, I've got five and a half gallons per minute. If you look up my chart there, five and a half gallons a minute. So yeah, right around six feet per second. So you can see the water is really racing through there. That's too fast really, but I wanted to show you how air removal, even if you're running your, your you can see there how it's kind of squirreling through there. And you can see the little micro bubbles coming out of solution there, even at that high speed. So basically I've turned that circulator into a wearing blender. And there was a song a while ago that said, put me through some changes, Lord, sort of like a wearing blender. If you can name the artist or the name of that song, I'm gonna give you a free uh, air vent, we'll send it to you. It was uh, 1976 was a year, so that might date me a little bit, but uh, I always remember that wearing blender thing when I think of a circulator pump that's way over pumping a circuit because that's what you're gonna get is just a foamy water like you see going on in there. Now, I will, after a period of time, get those little micro bubbles out of there, even though it's foaming up like that from that, that high velocity that I'm going through there, but, um, yeah, you don't want to over pump a circuit. It just makes the air removal that much tougher. And just know that glycol is a really stubborn fluid to get the air out of. It takes so much longer than uh, uh, than regular water. So let me get this off and get back to my presentation, Mary. And I don't know if you want to do the camera again, but. <clears throat> Bob, we have got a hand up. All right, let's do it. Dennis. Hi, hey, Dennis. Hello. Yeah, we can hear you. You can hear me? Yeah. Uh, are you looking for Poor, Poor, Pity Me? Song by <laughs> Linda Ronstadt? That's exactly it. Actually, it was <laughs> Warren, Zavon, Warren Zavon, I think, wrote it, but I think Linda did a better cover of it than uh, Warren did, but that's exactly right. So uh, I don't know if we have your address, but get it to us and we'll I'll send you a, an air vent with a check valve and a hydroscopic cap. How's that? And I'll throw in a check valve cap for it. I'll give you a four and one. Thanks for playing our game. No problem. <laughs> And Bob, uh, Eric Ani has been very patient uh, oh, okay. with a question, and uh, it regard is in regards to hygroscopic caps. So he's wondering if the hygroscopic caps can be used on any other brand auto vents. Yeah, they will. You know, I think most of the air vents out there are um, metric threads on the top. Like I say, the only one that I found that it won't work on is that old made of the, and I say old made of mist, but those kind of sheet metal or sheet brass type of air vents. Those are made in the U.S. and they've got a kind of a shred. They've got a tire stem cap on it, basically is what they have. But I've tried them on Watts. I've tried them on Taco. I've tried them on some of the Honeywells. But uh, uh, I can't promise it'll work on every single one out there. But every vent that I've seen, um, you know, it's the same thread and the cap will fit on it. So they're a handy little cap to have. I mean, I've I put them on, like I say, inside of boilers anywhere that I'm worried about a vent making a mess someday. It just gives me a little bit extra uh, peace of mind or protection on a on a vent. What else you got, Mary or Kevin or? Well, we have another hand up. All right. Well, we did. I'm sorry. Um, Sean, did you have a question or maybe that was false alarm? Kevin, well, are you seeing any other questions? I do. I, I see a question from Andy McGee. Okay. How many feet per second do you want to put into a system when trying to remove debris? For that's example, when you're switching from an old cast iron to a new yeah. high-efficiency boiler, that's a great question about dirt. Yeah, it is. And so here's what happened. A couple of years ago, I was at a, a geo uh, expo in Tulsa, Oklahoma, the Expo show down there. And we had a booth set up there, and we were trying to sell some of our air vents and stuff to the geo people. And a couple of doors away from me was this company out of Texas called Purgerite. So I get to talk, and these guys say, well, what do you guys do? He said, well, we go around the U.S. and Canada, and we purge out problematic systems. I said, well why would I need you to do that? Isn't that what I do? And he said, well, a lot of people don't understand that if you've got dirt and debris in an old system or in a geo loop, and they do big stuff. I'm talking like four inch pipe size. They can purge up to 24 inch diameter pipe with these different pumps. And I said, well, what, you know, what's different about what you do and what I do if I'm trying to purge an old system and get the rust and crap out of it? He said, the velocity. He said, you got to get the pipe velocity up above five feet per second. He said, as soon as you hit that number, five feet per second, he said, stuff will just come out of the pipe. And he had pictures of stuff they had purged out of old systems. And so what they do is they go into a job and they put these kind of, they're like big handcuffs that go around the pipe and they're ultrasonic flow meters. And he said, what we do is we measure the side of the pipe, size of it, and we put the uh, flow meter, uh, the the ultrasonic uh, flow meters around it. And they said, then we go out in the parking lot and rev up the, and they've got a, like a, turbo Cummins diesel powered pump that can pump that kind of flow out there. He said, we'll rev that up until we know that the flow velocity going through that pipe 
by measuring the feet per second gets us that five feet per second. By measuring the gallons per minute, I mean on the flow meter, they convert that with that little chart I just showed to feet per second. He said, five feet per second is the magic number. He said, anything above that five feet per second. He said, sand, he said, cell phones and tools and rags and everything else that they purged out of systems. They had all kinds of pictures of what they had taken out of systems over the years. He said, that's the number that you have to get up to. So, you know, for you to do that on a job site, you're almost gonna need a pump cart. Uh, and, you know, depending on the size of the pipe you're doing, you might need a big pump cart. You know, that little half horse, you can probably do up to maybe inch, inch and a quarter. You can get up that kind of flow velocity. But if you're trying to pipe a big job with inch and a half, two, three inch, whatever, you're starting to talk about five, 10 horsepower worth of pump to be able to do that. In fact, the smallest pump that company had was a five horsepower. And the biggest one, they had two, I think he said 160 horsepower Cummins diesel pumps on a big fifth neck, uh, uh, fifth wheel gooseneck trailer that they would haul around when they had to do, you know, large jobs. He showed a job that was in Indiana somewhere. It was a geo loop field that was put under a parking lot, unfortunately, and had never worked from day one properly. And so they figured they had some airlocks and stuff. They were actually two inch loop fields came into a 10 inch header that came into the, the mechanical room and they hooked onto that 10 inch header and they purged that thing out and they had two sheets of plywood out in the parking lot that were just heaped to the top with sand they had blown out of that. So apparently they had pushed some tubing under the road and the cap came off whatever and they just filled a bunch of that tubing with uh, sand and it had never worked from the day it was put in there and it never had enough pumping power to move that fluid along through the system. So it took that kind of a you know, horsepower and getting that velocity up above that five feet per second to make that uh, that dirt particle start moving and coming out of there. So, yeah, that's that. Yeah, thanks, Bob. Uh, another one from Mike. Uh, seems to have issues with air vents and glycol systems over time. Yeah. Is there a trick for air valves to last in glycol systems? Yeah, you know, glycol, there's one good thing about glycol and only one good thing in my mind, it doesn't freeze. Everything else about glycol is just a pain in the butt to work with. You know, it leaks out of O-rings, it leaks out of seals, it leaks out of crimp joints. Uh, it's hard to pump. It doesn't exchange heat very well. Yeah, I know what you're saying. I mean, I've seen brand new ProPress joints leak from the day they were put in because of the that fluid, the surface tension, that fluid is so low, it just sneaks out of everywhere. So, yeah, you know, we've tried Buna rubber, we tried EPDM, we've tried all different types of uh, seals in our air vents. We think we got a pretty good air vent now and that we use a peroxide cured EPDM on our O-rings and that seems to be the most stable product that we've found but if the glycol goes bad and the pH drops or it gets real dirty it's just I don't know I don't have a really good answer. I would say just watch the glycol. The best thing that the guy from Dow Chemical told me about glycol I said take a glass and just take a little bit out of the glass and he said if it's ugly looking he said if it smells real bad get rid of the glycol because he said, number one, the pH is going to be down in the four, five, six range. It could be acidic, it could be really bad. But he said, you can usually tell by looking at it first in the glass, if it doesn't have the nice blue color, red, whatever it went in, if it looks like coffee, it's bad. He said, if it smells really kind of a harsh, like locker room smell to it, it's bad. So he said, most of the time you can tell glycol by looking at it if it's time to get it out of there because it's going to go after your, your seals and your O-rings and everything in your system. It's just the way there isn't really a better fluid out there for antifreeze that we found yet. So, all right, what else? Hey, Bob, this is John. Would you mind activating your camera again? Yeah, how do I? Uh, <clears throat> I thought Mary was going right to toggle there. me in and off there. There you go. Sorry about that. There I am. Let me get back down here, too. Do you want him to show his shirt? No, I just. <laughs> I'd love to see Hot Rod's face when he's talking. Well, that's what happens when I toggle to the videos. I got to remember to come back to my camera. So I've got a couple housekeeping slides. I mean, I'll stay as long as people have questions. If you want to, you know, read them or, or uh, open their mic. But this is our team. You know, they're working from home. But if you need tech support, we'll help with other brands. If you got a question about an air vent, we don't mind uh, chatting with you and helping uh, helping a brother or sister out if you have a question or an application question. Um, we do have. Uh, this Thursday, Mark Etherton is going to talk about commercial boiler retrofits. I do a lot of that at his company out in Denver. So he's going to give us some uh, some ideas, of trip, uh, tips and tricks that he's learned over the uh, probably 40 years. He's been pulling wrenches too. So if you got time this uh, Thursday at noon, tune in for that. You know, we try and keep a presence on all the different sites out there. I mean, it's a full-time job just keeping track of all this uh, these days. But uh, However you guys want to communicate with us. If you want to FaceTime with us from a job site, we can certainly do that and help you out. 
Um, this is what we've got in mind for the next couple uh, weeks here. We'll keep this going as long as you uh, like it. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, dirt and uh, magnetic separation next. And I want to talk about primary secondary. I built behind me that primary secondary tease, and I've learned a lot just by watching how primary secondary works and some of the uh, things that they didn't tell us about primary secondary back in the day that we'll talk about. And then I'm going to talk about the heat transfer, how different type of heat emitters work, how we size them, how we can run them at lower temperatures. So that's kind of what I've got, uh, got in mind. And I think, yeah, to make a long story long, thanks everybody for for hanging out with us tonight. Sorry, yeah. a little bit long. And Bob, before, before we tune out, uh, I've got some really good news about uh, our charitable donation. Uh, okay. Because of our very cool, awesome audience, uh, I checked the math twice. $895, well, we'll bump that to 900 So we're going to be splitting that between Chefs for America and Samaritan's Purse. So thank you, audience. Yeah, thank you, uh, and the Hub also wanted you to know that if you enjoyed this presentation, they are actually going to be posting this up on their website. Uh, so watch for that. You can re-listen or share it with friends. Uh, and yeah, stay tuned. We'll be back next Monday. Yeah, sorry I talk so fast, but I try and get excited about this and get a lot of information, probably more than a, uh, you know, 200 pounds of potatoes and 100 pound bushels, what we used to say back on the farm. So, but thanks for hanging in there with me. And, you know, let us know for topics that if you have some other things in mind, we can certainly, uh, you know, gear up for that pretty quickly and, and do it. And we're going to try some better technology. I'd like to be able to do a live demo. I don't know how well that streamed for you folks. Let me know if that uh, came through well enough. It's it's just a bandwidth issue. I wish there was a simple solution for that, but we're going to keep trying different uh, things until we get this as good as it can be. All right. Uh -huh. Uh, you had mentioned that uh, this presentation would be available to people if they if they want it. Yeah, I mean the PowerPoint slides. At the end of this, there'll be a survey if you want to fill it out, and it'll ask you, do you want the presentation? And I think almost instantly, Mary will send the the PDF file out to you. And then, as far as archiving it, I don't know, John and uh, Eric, how you guys do that on your end, but we'll make a we have to convert this to a different file. Mary does that somehow from the webinar, and then. Um, turn it into a YouTube or however you guys want us to send you that data. We can send you the raw file or whatever you guys need or want. It's it's yours. I mean, it's yours to use and have for uh, for whatever you want. We appreciate that. Thank you. Well, thank you guys for uh, you know presenting this whole concept. This was a great idea, and it's, it couldn't be a better time to to do at home learning. So uh, all the you know, kind of Everything came together right. Hey, Bob, this is Eric. I just want to say thank you. Um, and also just tell you, my phone is blowing up on Instagram. I'm getting tons and tons and tons of tags and messages okay. from everybody that's been watching all night. So they said you're doing an awesome job, and they're just super thankful that this training is coming together uh, for everybody at this time. So thank you. Thanks. Good to hear. All right, I think we'll, uh, Mary, unless there's anything else, Kevin, we'll call the call to wrap. Thanks, I think Bob. It's bedtime. <laughs> you bet. Thank you, everybody. It was a lot of fun. Thanks. See yeah. you. Bye-bye.